So yesterday, the lights went off here in Kharkov around uh, 2.30 in the afternoon. And uh, that uh, uh, had an impact on the heating situation as well. The lights went out, as far as I know, throughout the entire city. And uh, the heating kind of like went off maybe six hours after that. Uh, of course, you know, I guess it was just circulating and whatnot. I have no idea, but that's basically what seems to have happened. Uh, the lights came back on at uh, noon today. So all in all, it was about 22 hours without the lights. <clears throat> now, um, I'll tell you, it's incredibly dispiriting to be in a city without electricity. I mean, this is a subjective video, okay? I'm not going to be telling you anything new or anything particularly insightful for that matter. I just wanted to give you my, uh, my subjective impressions of what it's like to be in a major city with no electricity. Uh, first of all, right now here, it's cold. It's dipping below freezing. And, uh, you know, no electricity means no heating, okay? And you are constantly shocked by how much you need electricity. I mean, uh, in my own case, for instance, I need it for the stove. I need it, of course, for the, the computer and whatnot. Internet, of course, is gone. You know, and all of a sudden you realize that everything in your life depends on electricity, even getting to your own home. Because if you live in an apartment building, as I do, where you need an elevator, okay? I mean, it is not fun to be climbing God knows how many stairs, uh, you know, and, and carrying stuff or whatever. You know, it is a bit of a nightmare. It's dispiriting. And that's the only word I can think of, okay? You feel low. And uh, when the lights went out, you know, this morning I looked out, uh, the lights went out, like I said, at 2.30. It gets dark around here, like around 3.34 in the afternoon. And so, you know, like around uh, 6 p.m., there was like, you know, what am I supposed to do? So I just went to sleep because there was nothing to do. And I realized how much of my entertainment, how much of everything depends on electricity. I mean, I have a few books. But still, you know, uh, and of course, you have to read them with a flashlight, which I have. I have two, as a matter of fact, and lots of batteries. So I'm good on that end. But um, it reminded me of uh, when I was living in Chile in the very early 80s. In 83 and 84, I recall the communists, because there were communist insurgents, uh, they would blow up uh, electrical transmission towers and periodically there'd be no electricity. Um, and it was, um, I mean, at the time I was a kid, you know, 1983, 1984, I was 15, 16 years old. And so I didn't, you know, I, I didn't feel it as such a big deal as it were. Uh, also at the time, of course, I was living with my family, whereas here I'm on my own. And so here now I feel it. I feel that, um, you know, dispiriting because it really is. And, you know, I woke up in the morning and there's no traffic whatsoever, just a few cars here and there. And um, I did notice that there were some people who packed up their stuff, clearly. And uh, I saw them, you know, going down the staircase. You know, they were carrying their belongings and they had decided that, you know, they were going to leave, leave the city. I mean, they were carrying enough stuff after losing the lights that it was clear what their intentions were. Now, in my case, I'll admit, you know, I was thinking, you know, should I leave? Should I not leave? And what's worst of all is because there's no electricity, you have really no idea what's happened outside of your very, very small circle, you know, because you have no way of getting information. I mean, like the lights went out in the whole city. And so there's nothing. There's no TV. There's no Internet. You know, for all I knew, the whole world kind of could have gone up in smoke, smoke in a nuclear fireball, in a nuclear war. I wouldn't have known, you know. And so it was eerie. It was truly eerie. And of course, you know, back in 83 and 84, my life did not revolve around so many people who are so far away. I mean, when I was growing up in the early 80s, you know, there was no internet. There was no cell phones. There was none of that. But here, with no electricity, no cell phones, no internet, no idea of what's going on in the world beyond you. Mm -hmm. 
and it is deeply creepy. It really freaks you out. And you know, the, the electrical devices that you might have, you know, laptop, computer, uh, iPad, iPhone, whatever, you, you start like husbanding the energy and, and worrying and, and putting, turning down the brightness of the screen so as not to suck up any more juice from the batteries. Mm -hmm. Because you want to keep them at least functioning. I mean, you, you don't need them right away, but you're figuring maybe at some point I will. You also start thinking to yourself, if I see anybody with a generator, and I saw a few people, uh, or passed by, I mean, I could hear the engine coming from some building, and I realized that they had a generator of some sort. You know, you, you think to yourself, well, better carry, you know, a plug so that, you know, I can charge my devices if they're kind enough to allow me. A couple of people actually were. It was, it was, um, it was very nice of them. But the, the thing is, see, you feel scared. Mm -hmm. It's not so much that you're worried about something that's going to happen to you. It's that you have no idea what's going on in the wider world. Uh, I mean, you feel really isolated. Uh, at least that's my subjective perception. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, you know, cutting the lights truly is dispiriting. I keep going back to that word because that's the truth of it. You know, everybody I saw just looked a little bit down. And when the lights came back on, like I said, around noon, um, everybody, there were more cars. It was more like, you know, more life all of a sudden, right? Um, and I went to a supermarket to get some food and uh, and the people just seemed better. I mean, a lot better. They seemed like they were just rolling with it because I actually went to a supermarket twice, once in the morning um, when they had, you know, everything was dark in the supermarket except a few lights here and there uh, from obviously a generator that they have in the back and, you know, one or two cash registers and uh, there was like a really long line. I was thinking, no, I'm not going to make this really long line because I have other things to do. Um, and so I thought, you know, later when I go back, then I'll stop by the, um, the supermarket, which is what I did. And, and there, of course, the lights were all shining bright and everybody was just more cheerful. When you lose electricity, it just sucks the will out of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, it's my subjective perception insofar as... I am concerned, but it was what I noticed in other people. Mm -hmm. the, the morning crowd, they looked dejected. They looked scared, quite frankly. Uh, and why wouldn't they be? Whereas in the afternoon, everybody felt, okay, well, things are better, you know? And so I just have to say that um, I think the notion of knocking out the power grid that the Russians are doing, obviously they're doing it because they want to prevent uh, the, the rail system from working from moving uh, Zelensky regime forces from, from end to end of the country. Yeah, that's certainly a military objective, but it has a huge psychological impact on the civilian population. And I think that if they continue to do this, there is going to be more and more refugees flooding out of the country. Even if the local authorities are able to turn back the lights after every one of these attacks, they'll be able to do it. Now, this is the fourth, I think, uh, a power outage I've experienced. The other ones, the longest one before was actually the first one, which lasted eight hours. And then subsequent to that, I think the second one lasted uh, five hours or something like that. I, I don't recall. And after that, it was like two hours. It was no big deal. But this one, you know, 22 hours, you know, it took a lot out of people. I mean, you know, people left. Okay. And so, yeah. I think that the refugee issue is going to become something that the West is going to have to deal with. Because if the Russians continue knocking out the electrical system, continuing, continue demoralizing the civilian population with the loss of electricity, then those civilians are going to flee. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, if, if it were possible to do some sort of graph of it, I think that every time they hit the electrics, you know, a, a few more people start to leave. And where are they going to go? Because, of course, they can't go to Russia at this point because, uh, uh, you know, the fighting. And so they have to go west. They're going to go either to Belarus, I suppose, if you can go. Um, and perhaps, I have no idea to tell you the truth at this point, maybe there's some uh, entryway into Russia itself. 
but for the most part, they're going to go to Poland, they're going to go to Hungary and Romania, and they're going to just flood the West again, you know, a second big wave. Now, that's my guess at this point. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the good thing is that, you know, with the loss of electricity, I didn't have to worry about anything in my refrigerator. Yay. <laughs> You know, because this morning, you know, it was damn cold. It was damn cold because, like I said, you know, the heating system does not work with electricity. There's something else, too, that's pretty interesting is that, see, uh, a lot of office buildings, you know, the, the newer ones, the more modern ones, they have these uh, sprinkler systems, emergency sprinkler systems, right? And the thing is, see, that that's something I hadn't realized, that those sprinkler systems have water in them. They're pressurized, of course. I mean, not with a lot of water pressure, but they're ready to go because they're emergency sprinklers in case of fire. Mm -hmm. And so in some of the buildings that are being maintained, somebody has to go there and drain all that water. And they have to go office by office, you know, removing the sprinkler and, and letting it flow out and removing all the sprinklers because if they don't, the water that's inside over the winter in the unheated buildings, well, it's going to expand and burst. And so you're basically going to have a building with a completely ruined system, a completely ruined building, quite simply, because all that water will just burst out and it'll just flood uh, the office buildings, right? I mean, it's not that much water, right? But it'll make a mess. Mm -hmm. And so some office buildings are having to do this. And, uh, and obviously some are not doing that because there's not the manpower, there's not the availability, there's not uh, the possibility of entering these offices where this is going to take place over the winter because these office buildings are not being heated. As I understand it, the office buildings are getting cut from the heating system, which makes sense. You, you want to husband that resource and assign it to uh, residential areas, not to empty office buildings, right? So yeah, there is a little uh, data point, but um, in general, <clears throat> I think that this is um, uh, uh, this hurts morale. This hurts morale a lot, and also you got to keep in mind something that since the special military operation started on the twenty fourth of February, the Russians have not been hurting civilian infrastructure. Whatever the Western media is saying, that's not true. They haven't been hurting it. In fact, at the beginning of it, they went out of their way to leave the civilian infrastructure alone, or even infrastructure that was dual purpose, civilian military. But only in September are they hitting the electrical systems, okay, because of a military necessity that I explained before. And that is demoralizing in a way that nothing has been before, because, see, before losing electricity, before you could say, oh yeah, there's a war going on, but people kind of like went along their lives. You know, in, in what was left of February and into March, all of Kharkov was sort of like quiet, like nobody was around. But in April, May, things picked up. And over the summer, it was like, you know, business as usual. I mean, it felt like that, right? I mean, there was even like uh, nearby where I live, there was like this uh, shop. It had been like one of those like stop and go type places where you can pick up sodas and hamburgers and emergency supplies, that sort of thing, right? And it, it had before the war, it had gone out of business and it was empty. Uh, but in May, June, I noticed that somebody was building something in it, a new stop and go or some other thing. I have no idea to tell you the truth, but they were building something. I mean, so obviously, you know, things were kind of like, getting back to normal even as the war was taking place. But when you lose electricity, especially for a prolonged period of time, and you know exactly why, then it just, it's demoralizing. It's dispiriting. Yeah. And so, yeah. These are just my impressions. You know, I mean, I, like I said, I'm, I'm, like I said at the beginning of this video, I'm not going anywhere interesting. I'm not going to give you any in interesting tidbits. But I thought that you'd be interested in knowing. And to tell you the truth, um, in the early 80s, see, when the communist uh, quasi-insurgency, because it didn't quite break out, but they were trying to. They were robbing banks and blowing up stuff so they could get the money to buy the weapons to have a real insurgency. And that, that happened in the early 80s. And 
didn't know because I was there, right? And so uh, when that was happening, there was a sense, a collective sense, that, you know, these bastards are screwing with our lives by cutting electricity, you know, we, we got to squash them. That was the generalized consensus, okay? And people were happy, even left-wingers were happy for the Pinochet dictatorship to really go and squash these uh, communist terrorists, really, because they were terrorists, okay? There was a collective sense that, you know, screw these people, they can't be messing with our lives by turning out the lights every other day, which for a while, especially in 84, I recall, was happening. Mm -hmm. But here it's different because there's the collective sense that, oh boy, we're dealing with something far bigger than ourselves. We can't squash it. And the authorities in charge can't squash it and, and just like be done with it. Okay. And, and that difference, actually, now that I, I say this and verbalize it to you, I think that that's the biggest difference because, like I said, in the early 80s, there were all these power outages and they were much, much more than what's going on here in Kharkov now. Um, but there was a sense of these guys are annoying us to stop it already. It, it, it wasn't so dispiriting. It was annoying, but it didn't, you know, demoralize people. But this is. I'm just saying that um, just to give you, like I said, the subjective impressions. And yeah, that's all I have to say for today. Know what's going on.